So hi everyone. Um, today we'll be talking to you about PASS, our system for automatically parallelizing shell scripts, or how to get from this to this. Uh, in this talk, I'll go over the overarching research around PASS and focus on its just-in-time component. Uh, our system is open source, you can find it here, and it's supported by the Linux Foundation. Uh, be before I start, I, I, I should say that this is joint work with many amazing people, uh, including some of whom are in the audience here, uh, Tamam, Achilles, and Michael are in the audience. Uh, and um, we build on work by many others that helped uh, throughout this uh, past project. And also, Michael and Nikos are both hiring students, so contact them if you can and if you want to work on the shell. We have a lot of ideas. So let's start from the shell, from, from, from the beginning. So the shell is used by everyone. It's ubiquitous. You can use it for orchestration, data processing, automation tasks, you name it. I mean, in both keynotes, we heard it. You, you, people use the shell a lot. So, um, uh, and don't take my word for it. Um, uh, it's, it's, it has been steadily on the top 10 of programming languages based on the GitHub survey. So the shell is actually unavoidable. And uh, why is that? It's ubiquitous because it has many great properties. So the shell allows for universal composition. So it can compose arbitrary commands using files and pipes, allowing users to create powerful and very succinct scripts. Uh, it's Unix native, um, so it is well suited to, to files and strings, which are abstractions used uh, in Unix. And it's also interactive. And so the complete system environment is accessible, and you can quickly experiment uh, with, uh, to achieve what you want. And no other programming environment can substitute it. Um, so let's look at an example of a script to see how the power of the shell. So this script here computes the maximum temperature in the U.S. for the years 2015 to 2019, based on data from, uh, from some national organization. And to do so, it first fetches um, the indexes of temperature data archives. It then downloads this archive data. Um, and then it extracts this data with GANZIP. It cleans the data. And then it computes the maximum by sorting and uh, taking the first line of, uh, of the output. The first three steps, we can call them pre-processing and the rest processing. And this script, uh, we took it from the, uh, the, the pre-processing part of the script, actually. We took it from uh, the Hadoop book, um, uh, where it's used for an exercise, so the part until the gun zip. Uh, and the final two lines replace the MapReduce program in the Hadoop book. And this program was actually equivalent uh, to this, and it was 150 lines of Java code. I don't know, I, this feels really, really easy to, to, to compute the maximum temperature. So the shell is great, uh, this script shows that, um, but most shell scripts are sequential, um, and uh, they have actually more issues, we'll come back to that later. Um, and parallelizing them requires a lot of manual effort. You can use specific command flags like dash p for short or G, um, parallelization tools as GNU parallel. You can rewrite your scripts. But, but that's, that's pretty hard. And uh, um, I mean, we don't want our kids to, to come to this world like this. It's, it, this is not good. So enter, enter PASS. So PASS is a shell-to-shell -shell compiler that exposes latent data parallelism in, in shell scripts. And it does so by translating shell scripts to a data flow model abstraction that we have. It parallelizes data flow, these data flow graphs, and then it turns them back to shell scripts. And that allows it to be, um, to work on top of any shell because it just produces a shell script that you can then run on your favorite interpreter, like Bash. Um, and so let's see what Bash can do on this temperature analysis script. So we will, we will execute this script that I showed you on Bash. And uh, during the pre-processing, uh, Bash takes about 33 minutes um, and the processing takes about 10 minutes. Uh, this is on 82 gigabytes of, uh, of data, the five years of weather data that I showed you. And so let's now see what, what happens if we run it with PASS. So PASS uh, speeds up the pre-processing by about uh, two times and speed ups the processing by about 12 times. The total uh, combined speed up is about 252, but the important thing is that while Hadoop and many other data processing frameworks only focus on that part, uh, and, and the pre-processing part is not the focus. And, and despite that, PASS can actually parallelize it and get benefits that wildly surpass the benefits of the processing part. So we think that's pretty important that you can, that you can get uh, these holistic uh, performance improvements on your scripts. So how does PASS achieve these things? Uh, first of all, commands are black boxes. 
uh, and we cannot run an analysis on any, on any command that you have because they can be arbitrary binaries. So what PASS does is, is it introduces a command specification framework that uh, relates command invocations to, to a, a more um, clean and elegant abstraction, that of data flow nodes, that we can then manipulate and, uh, and parallelize. And, um, and, and the important thing about the annotations is also that they, they, they allow to turn commands to nodes and also back to command invocations to create data flow and um, shell scripts from the data flows. Um, and we also introduce an order aware data flow model uh, where uh, we do parallelizing transformations on it. And this model is formalized and we have proven this transformation is correct. So up to this point, uh, this is, this is uh, just context of the PASS framework. And you can read more about this in our papers uh, um, in, at yours and ICFP. So PASS follows the static way, performing parallelization ahead of time. And this is guided by discussions that we had with several programming languages researchers. So to refresh your memory, you should do a static analysis. Do a static analysis. The type system. You should do a static analysis. Static analysis. So that's what PL researchers think. Uh, and that should be OK, right? I mean, uh, no, actually, no. So these, these cells here are furious that we even thought that static analysis is correct for this, for this kind of purpose. So in reality, uh, the, the reality is much more complex. And the cell is very dynamic. So look at the script here. Uh, it depends, its execution depends on the current directory, on environment variables, on unexpanded strings, on the state of the file system. This LS here will uh, create a string of all the files in the system. This is, this is madness. And uh, static parallelization has to choose to be either sound but conservative, aborting when encountering dynamic information, or unsound and optimistic, assuming that variables will not change throughout the script. But this assumption is not, is not really, is not really uh, valid. So here is, is where our just-in-time approach comes in. So PassJIT tries to parallelize as late as possible, providing all the critical information to the compiler, such as the state of the shell, the variables, the directory, the files. And that is not only correct, but it also allows it to be faster due to this just-in-time nature. And, and how does it achieve it? By constantly switching between evaluation and parallelization. So to explain that in, at a high level, I will, I will guide you through an example of uh, the execution of, this, of the end of the script that I showed you um, on, on, on pass. So what will happen with the script? Uh, it, it will start executing in the shell. Uh, it, it has these two uh, values for these environment variables, and it will try to expand this, this variable here. Um, as you can see, uh, out was not uh, set, so it, it defaults to top.out uh, slash out. Great, so we now move to this, ls run, and it had two files in this directory. And now we arrive to this uh, pipeline here, and pass here stops, stop the, stops the shell, and checks if it can actually parallelize it, because it's a potentially parallelizable and the place that it can get benefits from. And so it will try to parallelize, and before parallelizing, it will ask the shell to expand the strings. So it will go back to the shell and, and ask it, could you please expand the strings for me? And then the shell will expand them, and then PASS can now parallelize this fully expanded static pipeline, and it will succeed. And it will create a parallel script that it will instead uh, give to the shell to run. So um, I will now show you um, uh, an overview of PASS and its architecture and how it achieves these things. And the important goal that, that PASS also satisfied is that we do not want to, to uh, be tightly coupled to a specific shell. So the way that pass JIT uh, su uh, succeeds in that is that it uses a preprocessor that replaces all potentially parallelizable regions. And this, this replacement does not need to be precise because at runtime we will determine whether we can actually parallelize. Uh, we have re-implemented the parsing library uh, that allows us to parse and unparse scripts. Um, uh, that, and this is used by both the preprocessor and the compilation server. Uh, then we have the just-in-time engine, which is actually simply just a shell script uh, that um, saves the, the, that essentially makes uh, uh, the parallel execution transparent from the perspective of the shell and the user. And then we have the compiler that does the compilation as I showed you. And finally, all of this is simply executed on the user's shell that has no idea that it's not given the original script that the user intended. And let's zoom in a little bit to some of these components. So let's first zoom into the JIT engine. So the JIT engine, its goal is to hide the compilation from the perspective of the shell. 
And to do that, it, it has the following, um, this is a diagram of its, of its uh, workflow. It first saves the shell state and, uh, and stores it somewhere and uh, enters a pass, pass state. And then it queries the parallelizing server to ask it to compile um, that particular uh, parallelizable, potential parallelizable fragment. Then it recovers the state of the shell and it simply um, executes either the optimized version, the parallel, or the original if parallelization failed for whatever point. So this, this allows it to be highly compatible because um, uh, not, from the perspective of the shell, nothing has changed. Uh, and there were a lot of tiny details that we have to deal with here and you can find about, uh, out about those in our paper if you read it. Um, now we'll talk a little bit about the compilation server. So the compilation server um, originally, PASS was a, a compiler that you invoked and it produced a parallel script, but we, we changed its structure to a, a, a long-living stateful compilation server. And this reduces latency because it does not require any initialization and keeps all the state in memory. Uh, and this is necessary for the feasibility of this in practice because in tight loops, um, the milliseconds count um, for, for small scripts. Uh, and this compilation server also enables additional optimizations. So one of them is that it can par now parallelize independent fragments that were not parallel in the, in the original script. For example, iterations that simply touch different files. Um, it also does profile guide optimizations, like uh, uh, monitoring profiling, the execution time of a script, and configuring uh, the width of parallelization in later um, executions of the same loop, for example. And if you want to, to see more details about, about that, you can check out our paper. But now we'll switch to the evaluation. Um, which is an important aspect of our work. So, as I said in the beginning, as the title says, actually, of this paper, this is correct. Well, how should we evaluate correctness in this? Uh, the better way, uh, the, be the best way, <laughs> is to use the POSIX shell test suite, uh, which is this, this thing right here. Uh, it's huge, it's so terrifying, and this is actually how I see it, because it took us about a whole year to engineer uh, pass and make sure that we deal with these tests and, and pass them. And so this suite contains 1,000 assertions, 400 tests, 20, um, 29,000 lines of code. It covers all shell behavior from pipes, redirections. Um, uh, many, it contains many Unix utilities and so on. And it covers many edge cases. And so we run pass and bash on this uh, shell suite. And out of these 408 tests, bash passes 376 and fails 32 and pass passes 374 and fails 34. So we, we diverge in only two, two uh, tests. And in these two tests, we both error, but with a different exit status. And this is actually a, 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 a tiny detail that um, I will not get into the details of why that happens, but uh, uh, it's not really, though, um, uh, an, an issue, both error. And so to put this number into, in, into, into context, other cells compared to bash, if you look at them, um, uh, for example, DASH or KSH or MKSH, uh, this, this table shows how many tests they fail and BAS succeeds. And you can see that these are uh, two-digit numbers. Uh, and these are much bigger than what PASS does. Uh, and so for some more context, this is um, a diagram where every cell is a test of the POSIX cell test suite. Um, and uh, the, the, more, uh, the darker the, the dot, the more uh, cells fail. So you can see that in many, in many test cases, only a few cells fail, and these are not the same always. So there's, there's wide divergence of their behaviors. So the key takeaway from this is that by following this lightweight SIM approach, instead of re-implementing the shell, we achieve very high compatibility with BAS, allowing you to, to plug and play uh, PASS without actually uh, risking uh, breaking your, um, uh, your, the behavior of your shell scripts. And so, what would correctness be if we don't have performance? So uh, we also evaluated pass on 82 shell scripts, four suites and 11 standalone scripts. So we have four suites on the left of the diagram that I will show you and 11 scripts on the right. And um, the y-axis is the speed up compared to bash. Um, and there will be two, there are two, colo there are two colors here. The red one is the just-in-time version of pass and the orange one is the um, ahead-of-time version of pass. And so you can see that, first of all, PASS does not handle many of these scripts because it's ahead of time. So the whole NLP suite and all of these scripts, it, does, it cannot handle them. And for the rest, PASS is much faster. PASS JIT is much faster. And this speed up on average is 5.8 compared to 2.9 of PASS ahead of time. You can see more details about our evaluation. We evaluate also some um, aspects and focus on some aspects of the system in our paper. And so to conclude, 
um, uh, cells, the cells were very angry that we tried to paralyze them statically, and we can now make them happy by being dynamic, uh, and correct, and fast. And so, as I said in the beginning, the cell has many more problems. Uh, it's error prone. Um, it's hard to learn. I still Google um, to whenever I want to write uh, any cell script. Um, and it, it performs the dynamic computation. Well, there is an exception for that. The best paper at ATC 2022 that uh, was uh, presented this morning actually fixes that problem. This is a great paper. You should read it. Um, and there's also lack of support for contemporary deployments. Uh, for example, managing a distributed cluster. And so what we think, um, so, so, so uh, we believe that, that ultimately as our work is not simply, uh, um, the benefits are not simply that it can parallelize cell scripts, but we can also view, is, view it as an enabler. So the just-in-time structure of past JIT enables additional analysis uh, and solutions. So if you simply take the skeleton of our work and replace the compilation server with your analysis, you can make tools um, that solve other problems, like um, a cell monitor that ensures the safety or security properties of, uh, of, uh, of a system are not violated, a fully distributed cell, or an incremental execution cell. Um, talk to us if you have ideas. And as I said, Michael and Nikos are both hiring, so if you have ideas, yeah, you should talk to them. So yeah, I will close this talk with the practical impact and availability. Uh, so PASS is open source and hosted by the Linux Foundation. Uh, it has many contributors some, contributors, some of which are not in the core project. And it is virtually indistinguishable from BAS. And it requires no modification to your system. So you can just download it and play with it and try to parallelize your scripts. Uh, the artifact can be found also on GitHub. Um, thank you very much.